Hello, welcome to the Short Story Workshop. My name is Matt Bowles, I'm here with Melody Bowles and Simone King. Today we will be talking about dramatic irony and we're looking at the story The Vampire Made by Hume Nesbitt. So Simone, you pick the story, please introduce. So this is a old classic vampire tale. I was in a vampiric sort of mood, I don't think that's a spoiler because it's in the title. It's got a lot of tropes that I'm weak for, so I thought we'd give it a read. Cool. So here is The Vampire Maid by Hume Nisbet. It was the exact kind of abode that I had been looking after for weeks, for I was in that condition of mind when absolute renunciation of society was a necessity. I had become diffident of myself and wearied of my kind. A strange unrest was in my blood, a barren dearth in my brains. Familiar objects and faces had grown distasteful to me. I wanted to be alone. This is the mood which comes upon every sensitive and artistic mind when the possessor has been overworked or living too long in one groove. It is nature's hint for him to seek pastures new, the sign that a retreat has become needful. If he does not yield, he breaks down and becomes whimsical and hypochondriacal as well as hypercritical. It is always a bad sign when a man becomes overcritical and censorious about his own or other people's work, for it means that he is losing the vital portions of work, freshness and enthusiasm. Before I arrived at the dismal stage of criticism, I hastily packed up my knapsack, and taking the train to Westmoreland, I began my tramp in search of solitude, bracing air, and romantic surroundings. Many places I came upon during that early summer wandering appeared to have almost the required conditions, yet some petty drawback prevented me from deciding. Sometimes it was the scenery that I did not take kindly to. At other places I took sudden antipathies to the landlady or landlord, and felt I would abhor them before a week was spent under their charge. Other places which might have suited me I could not have, as they did not want a lodger. Fate was driving me to this cottage on the moor, and no one can resist destiny. One day I found myself on a wide and pathless moor near the sea. I had slept the night before at a small hamlet, but that was already eight miles in my rear, and since I had turned my back upon it I had not seen any sign of humanity. I was alone with a fair sky above me, a balmy ozone-filled wind blowing over the stony and heather-clad mounds, and nothing to disturb my meditations. How far the more stretched I had no knowledge. I only knew that by keeping in a straight line I would come to the ocean cliffs, then perhaps after a time arrive at some fishing village. I had provisions in my knapsack, and being young, did not fear a night under the stars. I was inhaling the delicious summer air, and once more getting back the vigour and happiness I had lost. My city-dried brains were again becoming juicy. Thus hour after hour slid past me, with the paces, until I had covered about fifteen miles since morning, when I saw before me in the distance a solitary stone-built cottage with roughly slated roof. I'll camp there if possible, I said to myself as I quickened my steps towards it. To one in search of a quiet, free life, nothing could have possibly been more suitable than this cottage. It stood on the edge of lofty cliffs, with its front door facing the moor and the backyard wall overlooking the ocean. The sound of the dancing waves struck upon my ears like a lullaby as I drew near. How they would thunder when the autumn gales came on, and the seabirds fled shrieking to the shelter of the sedges. A small garden spread in front, surrounded by a dry stone wall just high enough for one to lean lazily upon when inclined. The garden was a flame of colour, scarlet predominating, with these other shades that cultivated poppies take on in their blooming. This was all that the garden grew. As I approached, taking notice of this singular assortment of poppies, and the orderly cleanliness of the windows, the front door opened and a woman appeared who impressed me at once favourably as she leisurely came along the pathway to the gate and drew it back as if to welcome me. She was of middle age, and when young must have been remarkably good-looking. She was tall and still shapely, with smooth, clear skin, regular features, and a calm expression that at once gave me a sensation of rest. To my inquiries, she said that she could give me both a sitting and bedroom, and invited me inside to see them. As I looked at her smooth black hair and cool brown eyes, I felt that I would not be too particular about the accommodation. With such a landlady, I was sure to find what I was after here. The room surpassed my expectation, dainty white curtains and bedding with the perfume of lavender about them, a sitting room homely yet cosy without being crowded. With a sigh of infinite relief I flung down my knapsack and clinched the bargain. She was a widow with one daughter, whom I did not see the first day, as she was unwell and confined to her own room, but on the next day she was somewhat better, and then we met. The fare was simple, yet it suited me exactly for the time, delicious milk and butter with homemade scones, fresh eggs and bacon. After a hearty tea, I went early to bed in a condition of perfect content with my quarters. 
Yet, happy and tired out as I was, I had by no means a comfortable night. This I put down to the strange bed. I slept certainly, but my sleep was filled with dreams so that I woke late and unrefreshed. A good walk on the moor, however, restored me, and I returned with a fine appetite for breakfast. Certain conditions of mind, with aggravating circumstances, are required before even a young man can fall in love at first sight, as Shakespeare is shown in his Romeo and Juliet. In the city, where many fair faces passed me every hour, I had remained like a stoic, yet no sooner did I enter the cottage after that morning walk that I succumbed instantly before the weird charms of my landlady's daughter, Ariadne Brunel. She was somewhat better this morning and able to meet me at breakfast, for we had our meals together while I was their lodger. Ariadne was not beautiful in the strictly classical sense, her complexion being too lividly white and her expression too set to be quite pleasant at first sight. Yet, as her mother had informed me, she had been ill for some time, which accounted for that defect. Her features were not regular, her hair and eyes seemed too black with that strangely white skin, and her lips too red for any except the decadent harmonies of an Aubrey Beardsley. Yet my fantastic dreams of the preceding night, with my morning walk, had prepared me to be enthralled by this modern poster-like invalid. The loneliness of the moor, with the singing of the ocean, had gripped my heart with a wistful longing. The incongruity of those flaunting and evanescent poppy flowers, dashing the giddy tints in the face of that sober heath, touched me with a shiver as I approached the cottage, and lastly that weird embodiment of startling contrasts completed my subjugation. She rose from her chair as her mother introduced her, and smiled while she held out her hand. I clasped that soft snowflake, and as I did so a faint thrill tingled over me and rested on my heart, stopping for the moment its beating. This contact seemed also to have affected her as it did me. A clear flush, like a white flame, lighted up her face, so that it glowed as if an alabaster lamp had been lit. Her black eyes became softer and more humid as our glances crossed, and her scarlet lips grew moist. She was a living woman now, while before she had seemed half a corpse. She permitted her white, slender hand to remain in mine longer than most people do at an introduction, and then she slowly withdrew it, still regarding me with steadfast eyes for a second or two afterwards. Fathomless, velvety eyes these were, yet before they were shifted from mine they appeared to have absorbed all of my willpower and made me her abject slave. They looked like deep, dark pools of clear water, yet they filled me with fire and deprived me of strength. I sank into my chair almost as languidly as I had risen from my bed that morning. Yet I made a good breakfast, and although she hardly tasted anything, this strange girl rose much refreshed and with a slight glow of colour on her cheeks, which improved her so greatly that she appeared younger and almost beautiful. I had come here seeking solitude, but since I had seen Ariadne it appeared as if I had come for her only. She was not very lively. Indeed, thinking back, I cannot recall any spontaneous remark of hers. She answered my questions by monosyllables and left me to lead in words. Yet she was insinuating and appeared to lead my thoughts in her direction and speak to me with her eyes. I cannot describe her minutely, I only know that from the first glance and touch she gave me, I was bewitched and could think of nothing else. It was a rapid, distracting and devouring infatuation that possessed me. All day long I followed her about like a dog. Every night I dreamed of that white glowing face, those steadfast black eyes, those moist scarlet lips, and each morning I rose more languid than I had been the day before. Sometimes I dreamt that she was kissing me with those red lips, while I shivered at the contact of her silky black tresses as they covered my throat, sometimes that we were floating in the air, her arms around me and her long hair enveloping us both like an inky cloud, while I lay supine and helpless. She went with me after breakfast on that first day to the moor, and before we came back I had spoken my love and received her assent. I held her in my arms and had taken her kisses in answer to mine, nor did I think it strange that all this had happened so quickly. She was mine, or rather I was hers, without a pause. I told her it was fate that had sent me to her, for I had no doubts about my love, and she replied that I had restored her to life. Acting upon Ariadne's advice, and also from a natural shyness, I did not inform her mother how quickly matters had progressed between us, yet although we both acted as circumspectly as possible, I had no doubt Mrs Brunel could see how engrossed we were in each other. Lovers are not unlike ostriches in their modes of concealment. I was not afraid of asking Mrs Brunel for a daughter, for she had already showed her partiality towards me and had bestowed upon me some confidences regarding her own position in life, and I therefore knew that, so far as social position was concerned, there could be no real objection to our marriage. They lived in this lonely spot for the sake of their health, 
and kept no servant because they could not get any to take service so far away from other humanity. My coming had been opportune and welcomed both mother and daughter. For the sake of decorum, however, I resolved to delay my confession for a week or two and trust to some favourable opportunity of doing it discreetly. Meantime, Ariadne and I passed our time in a thoroughly idle and lotus-eating style. Each night I retired to bed meditating starting work next day. Each morning I rose languid from those disturbing dreams, with no thought for anything outside my love. She grew stronger every day, while I appeared to be taking her place as the invalid. Yet I was more frantically in love than ever, and only happy when with her. She was my lone star, my only joy, my life. We did not go great distances, for I liked best to lie on the dry heath and watch her glowing face and intense eyes while I listened to the surging of the distant waves. It was love made me lazy, I thought, for unless a man has all he longs for beside him, he is apt to copy the domestic cat and bask in the sunshine. I had been enchanted quickly. My disenchantment came as rapidly, although it was long before the poison left my blood. One night, about a couple of weeks after my coming to the cottage, I had returned after a delicious moonlight walk with Ariadne. The night was warm and the moon at the full, therefore I left my bedroom window open to let in what little air there was. I was more than usually fagged out, so that I had only strength enough to remove my boots and coat before I flung myself wearily on the coverlet and fell almost instantly asleep, without tasting the nightcap draught that was constantly placed on the table and which I had always drained thirstily. I had a ghastly dream this night. I thought I saw a monster bat with the face and tresses of Ariadne, fly into the open window and fasten its white teeth and scarlet lips on my arm. I tried to beat the horror away, but could not, for I seemed chained down and thrilled also with drowsy delight as the beast sucked my blood with a gruesome rapture. I looked out dreamily and saw a line of dead bodies of young men lying on the floor, each with a red mark on their arms, on the same part where the vampire was then sucking me, and then I remembered having seen and wondered at such a remark on my own arm for the past fortnight. In a flash I understood the reason for my strange weakness, and at the same moment a sudden prick of pain roused me from my dreamy pleasure. The vampire in her eagerness had bitten a little too deeply that night, unaware that I had not tasted the drugged draught. As I woke I saw her fully revealed by the midnight moon, with her black tresses flowing loosely, and with her red lips glued to my arm. With a shriek of horror I dashed her backwards, getting one last glimpse of her savage eyes, glowing white face, and blood-stained red lips. Then I rushed out to the night, moved on by my fear and hatred, nor did I pause in my mad flight until I had left miles between me and that accursed cottage on the moor. What did you guys think of the story? I thought this story was really cool. I like it a lot. It has a kind of very unique feel to it in terms of the prose has this kind of distant feeling while still having like the notion that someone is telling it to you. It has this kind of narrative voice, which I quite like. I like the the plot as well. You have a mysterious location and, and a mysterious woman who is not quite what she seems. Very much up my alley. I like that when I read the opening, I thought, is this me? Um, he is bored and says something like, um, oh, when men are bored, they get angry and hypercon like a hypochondriac <laughs> and I was like yes exactly you understand what it is to need something new um and then when he's out in the country and he says my city dried brains were again becoming juicy I was just like yes I feel like that when I go for a walk sometimes <laughs> I really like his use of language it's really original and interesting you, it kind of there's kind of this weird contrast going on with this beautiful landscapes and the singing seas, and then occasionally he will turn around and be like, "Lovers are not unlike ostriches," and you'll just be there like, "What? What does this mean?" <laughs> oh yeah, I was just thinking of that line. I love it. He's bizarre. I love him. It's also his writing style is almost surprisingly contemporary. In that, if I didn't know he was born ages ago, I would have assumed it's a story that someone could have published, like today. I don't know if anyone else got that. Some of the language feels older, but in terms of sentiment, it's so relatable that it feels strange that it was like over a hundred years ago. Because of the way it's written, I could tell it was an older story, mm. but I I didn't mind it because it was more surprising when he came out with this kind of stuff, you know? Mm. I expected it to be all formal throughout, and then he just drops these occasional lines that were like kind of funny. I was like, where did that come from? 
Yeah. They'd never had a sense of humour in the past. Well, I mean, I'm sure people did, but a lot of stuff that I've read from that time is, you know, it's, it's quite it's quite serious and dry. It's like almost like the Phantom Fourth, where you have this really serious academic guy narrating the story, which is about a ridiculous drunk phantom, you know? <laughs> Even if the story is kind of humorous, the narrator seems to be more serious in manner. So this was definitely a nice change of pace. One thing I liked in particular that has this kind of recurring theme about dreams, because the first thing that hinted towards this is probably the poppies early on, the Garden of Poppies, which are symbolic of dreaming. Are they? Huh. Yes, They're at least back then. Now, they've kind of been adapted into the, about being about the, a war symbol, right? But they were previously symbolic of like, Dreaming, sleep, um, also peace, death, that kind of stuff. Mitt, when I saw him describing the big um, field of poppies, I was just sitting there reading like, oh, of course, the garden is blood red, like the vampire's blood. The Greek god Hypnos was the god of sleep, and huh. he was very much associated with poppies. Interesting. So there was that. And then the climax of the story is when he is dreaming. And then he wakes up and realizes his dream is, is somewhat real and that he actually is being bitten by a, a bat, kind of a bat person, I suppose. But also I thought the style of it was almost dreamlike in that he there's not very much like direct dialogue or anything like that. It's all told as if it happened to him quite a long time ago, which gives it this kind of distance to it, which feels more like a dream. So I thought it was pretty interesting that it has that theme in so many different ways. It's a popular vampire trope, isn't it, of them kind of creeping into your dreams and everything like that. Like, it occurs in Dracula as well, doesn't it? I believe. Yes. Yeah. It's like a vampire power to get into your dreams, so it kind of almost fits in that sense. There's such a strong sense of the dreamlike would pervade the story. It kind of adds to the whole sense of the topic. The vampiric thrill. I think it's in Carmilla as well, actually, the dreams. Yeah. It's not a lot of vampire stories. Okay, maybe I missed that then. It's kind of just part of the genre, I suppose. It is, but then it's also worth noting in and of itself that he's doing it successfully enough and like integrated it throughout the piece. I think you're on the money with the um, Greek god because the vampire says her name is Ariadne and I was thinking, what? Oh yeah, that's true. I forgot about that. Yeah, I wondered why he'd pick that name for her. But if it's a Greek name, I mean... It links well to the Greek myth. So Ariadne in Greek myth is most famous for her role in helping Theseus kill the Minotaur. She gives him like a, was it a magic ball of string or something? Mm. So he can find his way out the labyrinth. I was trying to figure out why he decided to call her Ariadne, but maybe it is just to tie in the sleep theme. I don't know. <laughs> uh, ironically, Ariadne is the granddaughter of the sun god, which makes me laugh in the whole you know, vampires and sunlight thing, except, I mean, can she go out in sunlight? I'm not sure we've ever shown them together out in sunlight. Like, when they're out, it's in the moonlight. Or, no, wait, there's that bit when they're out in sunlight, so that I guess that mythos isn't handing. Yeah, I don't think that was addressed. Yeah, no, so they're out in the sunshine together, so it's not that level. I find that interesting in vampire stories, because you never know which bits of the vampire kind of power or mythos they're going to pick and which ones they're going to drop. It's always fun. Can you wave across at it in this one? How about garlic? Uh, can I get away with not inviting you in? <laughs> they seem to be the main ones. The One of my favourite books, I Am Legend, plays with this a lot, where half the book is the main character doing these weird experiments to see which kind of vampire tropes actually work. Vampires ever take over will be so lost trying to figure out which ones are the real myths and which ones aren't that will probably be dead in that time or whatever. And you'd probably get a couple of people being like, oh, vampires, they make me immortal. But anyway. <laughs> I can't see myself lasting long against vampiric thrall. <laughs> no, I'd be a sucker. All they'd need to do is, like, wear lovely clothing, have some nice boots, like, act a bit alluring, and it's like, yeah, sure, my blood, it's fine. I think in this story he says something to the effect of, oh, well, even Romeo and Juliet needed to set the scene for love and then he's like immediately like no she's the one she's all i think about <laughs> well he kind of blames it on his circumstances he's like oh it's just because i'm 
I've been so isolated out here in the middle of nowhere. He kind of implies that if he'd met her in the city, he wouldn't have cared. There is, I mean, there is something to be said about being transported away from your home environment because you do act differently when you're the outsider to a certain extent and you don't have your normal connections to rely upon. It's why in so many gothic stories or horror stories, you've got the main characters away from home and away from their normal people. It adds the tension because you don't know who you can rely on around you or what their secrets are. Yeah, that's true. What is the landlady to the to the vampire then? Is she the maid? I assume the vampire was the maid. Yeah, and they, they say the landlady is her mother, right? Mm. Yeah, but I thought maid is in like a servant. Mm. Maybe the title has two meanings. He's just that good. <laughs> oh, the meaning changes throughout time and it still works. Hang on, am I missing something? I thought they were just like mother and daughter. I mean, they are, but then if one's an immortal vampire, or presumably immortal, or unearthly creature, does that mean the mother is also a vampire? Or was the Ariadne her daughter and then she got turned into a vampire? Which is the sickness, I guess, that they talk about at the beginning. But did she actually get sick, as in turned into a vampire at that point? Or is that just a handy excuse for the fact that, oh, my daughter's become this strange creature. Come in so you can, you know, be her food source. Yeah, there are a few unanswered questions. I also don't think all of the questions need to be answered for the story to work. No. I did like the parallels between falling in love and being a vampire's fall. It was something I found really interesting about the story when I was reading it, just because we so often talk about falling in love in a romance novel in the same way we would talk about coming under a vampire's enchantment in a horror novel. You feel like you're under a spell when you're in love and... In the way a vamp- the vampire myth makes it a sinister thing instead of a lovely romantic thing, which a lot of stories have. So, you know, love at first sight is a pretty common trope in romance in romance novels. And the sort of this stories like this kind of go, well, maybe it's not such a good thing because maybe you can't see the truth of the person that you've fallen for because actually they're a blood sucking vampire. <laughs> mm. And it's- I guess leans into the whole seductive vampire trope as well. And I guess the point is you don't know that they're a vampire the same way you might not know something about someone when you first fall for them. I mean, they're probably not a vampire in the real world, but, you know. They can still leech your emotional energy and labour. They can be a spiritual vampire. Yeah, it makes the dream trope um, and the theme of dreams interesting because it's kind of the dream version of the relationship and what you think you're going to get out of it versus the, oh no, no, she's sucking your blood. You're going to die. Yeah. (laughs) Because in the dream, everything is good and you're having a lovely time wandering around the moors and then, no, suddenly there's a bat on your neck. (laughs) All right, let's talk about dramatic irony. So who's going to define what dramatic irony is for us? Frida knows more than the character basically is the simplest way of doing dramatic irony yes my favorite example is rope the hitchcock movie which i know we have all seen if you haven't seen it it's very good um the premise is that the main character murders this guy and then sticks his body in a chest and then proceeds to throw a dinner party while the body of their friend is just there and everyone's asking hey did he did he ever show up and they're like oh no he's busy yeah, so the story structure's relying on the fact that the audience knows, like, to a certain extent, for the joke or point to land. Because otherwise it would be really boring for them to watch if you didn't know that. Like, the tension comes because you know. And in this story it would be, for example, we know she's a vampire because of the title. Well, at least we can, you know, make a pretty good guess of it. It can also just be in the form of, like, jokes. So, for example, a... Example of dramatic irony that's quite popular is if you've ever seen the movie Titanic, which most people have, um, there's a character leaning on the balcony right before the ship hits the iceberg and they say it's so beautiful I could just die, which is a very dark version of dramatic irony, which <laughs> kind of makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. You can definitely play it for humour. It's very versatile because you can use it for suspense, horror, humour. And you can do a lot of character setup as well using dramatic irony if you're, for example, adapting something. And people will know more about the character you're adapting 
than the people in the novel world. So you can do things without having to explain because of the dramatic irony to a certain extent. That's specifically what we're talking about in this story as well, is you're using genre to set up this dramatic irony because we know that it's a vampire story. The guy in the story does not know it's a vampire story. And so we're waiting for the bad stuff to happen and he's just walking right into it. Mm. And it makes all the cutesy love scenes be like, oh my god, man, can't you see what's happening? Where otherwise they would just be kind of dull, cutesy love scenes. I was waiting for him to die. <laughs> see, that's the other part, though, with the dramatic irony, is that it is playing on your expectation that he's going to die at the end for his foolishness. But he doesn't, he escapes. I did enjoy that. I was like, what, this guy escaped, but he seemed so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm glad he escaped because I liked him. You've actually hit on my next point perfectly, which is one of the problems of dramatic irony sometimes is that it can make your characters seem stupid, right? Yeah. Like the audience knows something and it feels obvious to them and then the characters are just completely oblivious. Mm. It's like the opposite of a character being a genre, sadly. It's like the character in a horror movie goes, we should split up. No, you, sh you should not. <laughs> horror is full of this stuff because we know it's horror. The characters do not know that they're in a horror movie, otherwise they probably would behave quite differently. That said, I think as the genre has developed, we are seeing more genre-savvy characters because it's less conceivable that they can live in a world where there's no knowledge of vampires or anything. Like, you kind of have to set it in a completely different world nowadays if you're going to pull off the... I didn't know vampires existed thing. I mean, you, you don't want a horror movie with stupid characters necessarily, especially not all of them. You want at least someone who you can at least like in some way, right? I think my other favourite example is in Jurassic World. This is specifically about genre as well, because, I, I mean, this is also Jurassic Park, but more in Jurassic World, where you have um, female John Hammond telling us about how incredible her giant mutant dinosaur is. And we all know that it's going to break out at some point. So we're just sitting there like, are you insane? But she doesn't, she doesn't know that because she doesn't know she's in a Jurassic World movie. Yeah. And we all think she's stupid. In this one, for example, you could think he's really dumb because, oh, what a coincidence, she's getting stronger while I get weaker. There could be no possible correlation there. Would, except we as a reader know it's because she's a vampire. I think the story gets away with it because we can believe that he's reasonably intelligent and would still be seduced. Like it's like it's kind of out of his control, right? Mm. He also provides a reason or an alternative reason for what's happening, which is love. Like, because I think he says, I was frantically in love with her and it was love made me lazy, I thought. For unless a man has all he longs for beside him, he is apt to copy domestic cat and bask in the sunshine. So between that and the dreams, we're given a reason other than vampire for his, for him to believe in. It's not like he's not thinking, oh, this is strange, but you know, I'm not going to have any reason for it. I'm just not going to think about it. Like he thinks about it. He dismisses it and it makes sense within the internal logic of the story. Yeah, I think if you're going to do dramatic irony, that's one of the best ways to do it that has to be a good reason why the characters don't know what they don't know i think antagonist characters are sometimes the best to do dramatic irony with for that reason because i mean obviously because it's very difficult to do dramatic irony with a protagonist because the protagonist knows more in that sense if they're the kind of the center of the dramatic irony but with an antagonistic character you can reveal to the audience that they're the antagonist and still have the character working to uncover whatever their dark secret is, but because the other character is the antagonist, they're going to actively work to mask their behaviour. So even if we know there's good inbuilt tension and reasons why the protagonist wouldn't. Every time I say that, I'm thinking of NBC Hannibal, by the way. Brilliant example of dramatic irony. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. I feel like we haven't quite properly covered why you would want to do this? Why would you decide you're going to have some dramatic irony in your story? To keep the reader engaged? Yes, that creates tension. If you're waiting for the other shoe to drop or you can do a juxtaposition between something seemingly harmless happening with a more sinister truth. 
which puts us on edge without immediately putting the character necessarily in a kind of danger that escalates the situation. So you can draw out tension for longer. Yeah, it's like a good alternative way to to keep suspense going. Do you think that as readers we get a little thrill about knowing more than the characters as well? Do you think we like being, you know, more in the know than they are? <laughs> yeah, I think there's probably an element of that. Yeah. But the other interesting, I guess, argument you can make is that when a writer uses dramatic irony, it positions the reader to be complicit with the, for example, the murderer, because we know what they're doing and we're not acting to stop it. And obviously we can't because we're readers rather than within the universe. But it still positions you on the side of the vampire or the, because you're keeping their secret. That's true. That's a good point. Uh, the other thing that dramatic irony can be used for really well is humour. Yes. Uh, I, I guess humour is all about misunderstandings and people getting the wrong idea. Well, you gave an example earlier on the Titanic. Yeah, dark humour, but nonetheless humour. Uh, I like Shaun of the Dead, where the first like 40 minutes of the film are the characters just in absolute denial that they're in a zombie movie. They have no idea. And yet it's so painfully obvious. When he goes to the shop and there's all the the like there's all these alarms going off and um there's like blood stains everywhere and the guy isn't in the isn't in the news agent and there's no newspapers on the counter like normal and he just kind of goes eh, and leaves the money it's just <laughs> yes I love that whole sequence it's just so stupid Mulan is based on dramatic irony uh, how so because um in the sense that we uh, as the audience and Mulan, obviously, it's a it's one of the examples I can think of where the dramatic irony is based around the protagonist rather than the threat to the protagonist, which is what it most often is. Um, but we all know that she's just disguised herself as a man and joined the army. So in the Disney version, for example, a lot of the jokes and behavior of the other characters is based on the deception. So, for example, the main songs are "Be a Man" and "A Girl Worth Fighting For," which the juxtaposition there, there being that Mulan is not what she seems to be in that. Like, it's a whole sequence about becoming a man when she's disguised as a man. Kind of where the jokes come from. Like, dramatic irony is also, for example, if you're reading a love story and the main character is like, I will never fall in love with anyone. Oh my god, I hate them. And you know they're talking about the person that they're going to fall in love with. And you're just like, yeah, of course you hate them, you adorable little bastard. <laughs> no, I hate that. I'm sick of reading it. <laughs> you can, but I'm... At, least, at least have a good reason to hate them. If they have a good reason, it's different. If it's just, wow, I can't believe this guy. He didn't ask me if I wanted a cup of tea or some other flimsy excuse. I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Completely agree with you, but still a great example of dramatic irony in a non-tension setting. Yeah, that's a good one. All right, shall we, uh, since this is a vampire story... Should we talk a bit more about vampires? Where does this fit into the big vampire timeline? I don't really know. Dracula was published in 1897 and The Vampire Maid was published three years after in 1900. Okay, and this is after um, Carmilla? Yes. So... It was about 25 years before Dracula, I believe. So very early within the vampire mythos. I have no idea if Nisbet had read dracula or not i assuming I mean, maybe i shouldn't assume that he'd read dracula it seems likely i mean there can't have been that many vampire stories around the term vampire was popularized in western europe after reports of an 18th century mass hysteria of a pre-existing folk belief in the balkans and eastern europe that in some cases resulted in corpses being staked and people being accused of vampirism so early days in the vampirism um, history of vampirism, I guess. I think vampires have represented a lot of different things throughout history, depending on when they're written. So, because to me, they're kind of like the everyman monster, because they keep cropping up over and over again in a way that you see with other kind of supernatural monsters, but nowhere near as much. So I guess I'm interested why the vampire... I was kind of trying to think about why is the vampire so popular compared to others, and I think it's because of the fact that they're so applicable to so many different kind of stories and anxieties, like the whole blood thing can like speak to the like fears of, you know, 
crossing over blood and blood-borne diseases and all of that stuff. Um, paleness with like diseases and dying, like um, with intimacy because they're often very seductive. And they can just speak to a lot of different things, which I find interesting. Yeah, immortality as well, or mortality, I guess. What happens after you die? What happens to your body? I was gonna say, someone once told me that they were like a what was it? A metaphor for STDs, which I thought was very interesting. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the specifics of this theory. No, I've heard that one before. It's kids to turn into a vampire, aka a dead creature. Um, you need to have consumed the blood of another vampire, so it's the idea of mixing fluids, so, um, which during the aid crisis, if you were mixing fluids, so it could be kind of a death sentence. I mean, STDs is a broader version of that, but I think a lot of the metaphor around disease with vampires is, I think, AIDS-related. I could be wrong. I think they also mentioned, like, it being based around sexual fears, so, like, Carmelo was about being afraid of lesbians, and I was a bit like... Huh. <laughs> and there's the argument of the biting is quite well it's got sensual connotations doesn't it like it's either eating or, or you know kissing or biting during sex or whatever kind of thing which is the other part i think where the disease sex out of the vampire mythology comes in i'm interesting that this story we have a, a female vampire whereas i feel like in more modern stories it's more commonly the male that's the vampire right is that because a lot of the people reading vampire stories are women, and um, presumably straight women? Like, I know it's not exclusively straight women, but the whole, like, for example, Twilight and the whole boom in vampire love interests was very much pitched, I guess, at straight women and the fantasy vampire. God, I just remember, I just realised how gothic Stephanie Meyer's idea was. She said that she had a dream about it, and then she couldn't stop writing. I know. I do. I did find it interesting that it was a female vampire with a male protagonist. Like they could have easily flipped it, couldn't have they, with the handsome young son? I'm racking my brains for other female vampires and not really coming up with a lot. Vampires. Yeah. Um. There are some in Buffy, but I wouldn't say they were the main ones, if that makes sense. It's interesting, isn't it, how often it's skewed towards men, at least as men being the main vampire. Like, they often have female acolytes. Like, for example, there were the brides of Dracula, but people are far more likely to think of Dracula himself. There's Claudia in Interview with the Vampire, but again, the main leads are two male vampires. Eli and Let the Right One In. I don't know. They must be out there. I'm going to have to go find some. <laughs> I let them off because I'm yeah. I mean, obviously, there are some in Twilight. Oh, I have a final question. What do we think love is like being an ostrich means? Oh, it's because you, ostriches bury their heads in the sand, right? Right. So, I guess, is that not what you thought it was? I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I was confused. Oh. I was like, is it because they're big and they stick out? <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I think it's the idea that, that lovers think they're being smart and concealing their love for each other when actually everyone can just see them with their heads stuck in the sand. Mm, so they can't see the danger coming either. Yeah, that's true. Not because they're a bird with a big long neck. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, <laughs> because their head's in the sand. Well, that made more sense than anything I was thinking. <laughs> I did know about sticking their heads in the sand. I just thought it would be a funny question, but you know, <laughs> it does seem a bit strange. It was. It would took me a few seconds to figure out what it meant, and even then, I wasn't entirely sure. And because I always ask this, do we have any vampire book recommendations? I've already talked about I Am Legend. Yeah, I knew yours was going to be I Am Legend. I was more aiming that at Mel slash giving you the chance to extol the virtues of I Am Legend to our audience. I've done that before, I don't need to do it again. <laughs> True. The Coldest Girl in Cold Town is Good, it's by Holly Black. Oh, I love that one. Uh, yeah, the vampires are all living in their own cities and people try and, like humans want to try and get in and be one of them. It's uh, it's very good. I guess the other one I like is Carmilla. It's very good. All right. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening. 
As always, you can find all of our stories on our previous episodes on our website at shortstoryworkshop.com. If you'd like to contact us, you can do so via Twitter. I am at Matt B. Writer. Mel. At Sickaholic. And Simone. T underscore M underscore Trapwriter, also known as the Modern Trapwriter. Perfect. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back with another story next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.